Okay, this morning we're going to carry on talking about Jeremy Bentham and classical utilitarianism. And I'm going to begin by making a few points about um, the measurement of utility, uh, which we, we bumped into in a glancing kind of way last time, but we're going to dig into it a little bit. And then we're going to move from that into talking about uh, utility and distribution in classical utilitarianism, uh, how we should think about the measurement of utility across the whole society and what implications Bentham's argument has for that. And I think you'll start to see why classical utilitarianism became such an ideologically powerful doctrine in the 18th and 19th centuries. So just briefly to recap, we talked last time about Bentham's principle being maximize the greatest happiness of the greatest number, the idea being that if you think of, a, in this case, a very simple two-person society, um, and you think of that as the status quo, A has that much utility, B has that much utility, anything on this side of the status quo would be an improvement for society. The greatest happiness of the greatest number will have been increased. Now, that's all very abstract. And, and by way of trying to make it somewhat more concrete, let's notice two features of utility measurement. The first, as I, as I said to you last time, as far as Bentham is concerned, this is a doctrine of what I call objective egoism, that people are self-interested and behave self-interestedly, but that we can figure out what's, what's likely to motivate them regardless of their own interpretation of their actions or behavior. We have our interpretation. Remember, Bentham says, the rare case, as with, the, as with the physiology of the human body, so with the anatomy and physiology of the human mind, it's the rare case that you get it right about yourself. Um, and it's the objective scientific calculus that's going to tell us what maximizes people's utility. Now, you might say, well, how is that actually going to work? So there are two steps here. The first one is that he thinks all utility is quantifiable. I went through that last time. But the, the, the piece I didn't mention is that it follows from that that utility is reducible to a single index. And in this case, Bentham's thinking of money. Money is going to be the measure of utility in his scheme. And that means that we could think of these units of utility is having a kind of dollar value. So, you know, anytime you think this doctrine is, is crude or extreme, remember my point that this is, a, this is a guy who takes every thought to the logical extreme. But if so, you get one, let's, let's just for simplicity's sake, say one standard international util costs a dollar. And let's suppose you experience two standard international utiles of pain from coming to class, then I could make you indifferent between coming to class and not coming to class by paying you $2. I could get you to come to class if I paid $3, and I would not get you to come to class if I paid a dollar, right? And so that's the second point. In the, in the first instance, we, we say that utility is quantifiable and expressible through money, but then related to that, and as indicated in the example I just gave you, um, we can work with the doctrine of revealed preference. We can vary the price that we charge admission for the course. So let's say we, we charge, let's, let's imagine um, there are three of you, and one of you experiences two utils of pain from, for coming to class, one experiences three utils of pain, and one experiences two utils of pleasure. There's one perverse student in the audience who actually likes coming to the class. Um, so then it, we would find that if, if we paid a dollar 
one of you would come. If we increased it to 250, two of you would come. And so we could vary the price to get information about your utility. And we could even influence your behavior without actually changing your preferences. And that's a very important distinction to make. So we could, we could you, your preference to come or not, to your, your enjoyment from coming or not coming to class wouldn't change, but your behavior would change if we um, varied the price, okay? So that we can influence your behavior by manipulating the incentives without regard to what your underlying preferences are, and we could allow them actually to stay the same. You'd rather be at, at home asleep, but if the price is high enough, you'll come anyway. Okay, so that's all well and good at the level of thinking about uh, one individual's behavior. But what about thinking about society in a more general terms? When we talk about utilitarianism in Bentham's system, classical utilitarianism, we see that he operates with these numbers that attach to specific actions or policies, and that we can make comparisons across individuals. So to put this in the jargon of economists, Bentham allows interpersonal comparisons of utility. Bentham allows interpersonal comparisons of utility. We can say that if, if you take one unit of utility from one person and give it to another person, their utility will go up, and the first person's utility is going to go down. Okay, so it's a, it, it's a doctrine of interpersonal comparisons of utility. And for those of you who are mathematicians here, it might also be worth noting that Bentham operates with cardinal scales. These are additive things. You can actually think about these as sort of lumps of pleasure or pain experience that are moved around across people and can be added and subtracted. And so I've put up just here to sort of, so you can think your way through this doctrine. If you imagine a status quo of a perfectly egalitarian world in which each person has six units of utility, you can start asking yourself, well, let's imagine if we could redistribute things. What would that mean? as far as Bentham's doctrine is concerned. What I've given, he, given in this first column as a potential departure from the status quo is the utility monster example we, we talked about last time. If, if it turns out Leonid has a vastly superior capacity to experience pleasure than anybody else, then we, would, we, would, we could get a huge increase in total utility without, um, by taking a lot from B and C and giving it to Leonid. So um, that, that would say allow, right? Or we could think of this change from the status quo. We go to a more inegalitarian society, and again, the greatest happiness of the greatest number has increased. We have a world here where there are eight 18 utils in a world here where there are 19 utils. Or think about this case. We might think of this as a kind of schematization of the Eichmann problem. If, if the utility that the Aryans gain from uh, practicing genocide and ethnic cleansing against the Jews exceeds the utilities that the Jews lose, there would be no reason under Bentham's doctrine not to do it. Okay, now there's a certain ambiguity in the phrase maximize the greatest happiness of the greatest number, which Bentham never finally resolves. The ambiguity is whether he's saying just maximize the total. So here the total's bigger than 18. Here the total's bigger than 18. Here the total's bigger than 18. Um, so it's, it's obviously the case that it's preferable for, on Bentham's scheme to the status quo. 
Or is he perhaps saying, maximize the utility of the majority, the greatest happiness of the greatest number? The greatest number simply meaning the majority. But in that second interpretation, you could still get highly inegalitarian distributions being judged superior to the status quo. Because if you imagine going from here to here, we've got um, a majority here experiencing 12 utils of pleasure, and uh, here we have a, ma a majority of two experiencing 17 potentially utils of pleasure. So there is some ambiguity there as to just what Bentham meant, but most of the time he is taken as having meant just the crude statement, maximize the total amount of utility in the society. And so that nuance between whether we're saying the greatest number means a majority or just the total amount is not something that will detain us any further. Now, you could say, OK, so far so good, but isn't all of this a little counterintuitive? After all, um, if you compare, the, let's focus on the difference between the status quo and distribution four here. These people might be on the verge of starvation. Surely giving them a unit of utility is going to be much more enhancing to their happiness than giving A a unit of utility. Anyone know what the principle behind that idea is? Anyone want to take? How many of you have done Econ, the econ 101, the first Econ course? Yeah, so what, what, is, what is the principle that would tell you, um, what is the principle that would tell you if you have no food and I give you a loaf of bread, your utility goes up a lot more than if I have ten, 10 loaves of bread and I give you a loaf of bread. Somebody? OK. Diminishing marginal utility? Diminishing marginal utility. The principle of diminishing marginal utility of all good things. And this is, uh, this is the idea just encapsulated to make it a little bit more dramatic. If you don't have a car and somebody gives you a Porsche Turbo, your utility is going to go up a huge amount, right? But if you already have a Porsche Turbo and somebody gives you a second one, you're going to get less new utility from the second Porsche than you had from the first. And if somebody gives you a third one, you're going to have less utility, less new utility from the third one that you had from the second. It's not that you won't get any new, but you'll get less. And the principle of diminishing marginal utility says that this line will get flatter and flatter and flatter toward infinity. You'll always get more utility from a new increment of the same good, but it'll be less new utility than you get, got from the previous increment of that same Good. Okay, that's the concept of diminishing marginal utility. You, the new utility you get diminishes at the margin. Each new Porsche is less valuable to you than the previous Porsche. Now, is that plausible? Anyone think there's a problem with that idea? Yeah. Um, the idea with like shoes, if you're given like one shoe, you're going to get oh, absolutely no utility, but if you're given two shoes, like a right and a left, then maybe you'll get more utility. Okay. So shoes, like if we just kept giving you lots of right shoes, that'd be, the, that'd be a problem. Okay. Right. So I think Bentham would have to say it would have to be pairs of shoes, right? And yeah, I guess. Okay. So that's a good, but that's a, 
sets a great example to start us off on this. Um, what else? Any, any, anything else anyone might find problematic? Yeah, over here. Well, it just seems that if we're going by diminishing marginal utility, that if you had everyone literally, you know, dirt poor and always starving, if you gave them just a little bit of something, their happiness would increase so much more because it got that much little. But people would still be living in misery, technically. Just explain that a little more. Well, marginal utility is, you know, if you had a little bit of something for the first time, your yep. happiness increases so much more because yep. it's the first time. So if people were to, if you were to give people very little food or anything at all, and he just suddenly gave them a little bit, they'd get really, really happy about it. Yeah. But by his, by this, that then also if they were already very wealthy and they got something more, they wouldn't really be happy. So it'd be more beneficial to the utility if they only got a little bit. So they would be very, very happy. Okay, that's a very sophisticated observation. I'm just going to put it to one side and come back to it in about 10 minutes when I start talking about redistribution. Okay. But anything else about, if we're still focusing on one individual, anything else that might be problematic with this notion of diminishing marginal utility over here? Well, let's say you're C. Just because you're rich doesn't mean you don't want to be more rich. And just because you have a certain amount of money doesn't mean more money isn't going to make you equally as happy as it did before. Okay, that's true, but why is it problematic? Um, so I don't know. Well, well, I think you hit on something really important. There are a lot of people who think that the principle of diminishing marginal utility means that money is less important to people as they have more of it. We say after we said the principle of diminishing marginal utility of all good things, right? Money is a is a way of purchasing good things. So your your example might be thought to suggest that this implies the more money you have, the less important money is to you. Okay? So, you're right, but notice what that means. Does it mean that rich people will care less about money? It's a, it's a tricky question. Because the first impulse is to say, yes, they'll care less about money. But the answer is no. Why is the answer no? Yeah. They need more money to increase their happiness. Exactly. They need more money to get the same amount of happiness, precisely because of the principle of diminishing marginal utility. So you got it exactly right to see that money creates some problematic um, examples for the principle of diminishing marginal utility. But the, the thing that follows from it is that that for Donald Trump to get more utility, you have to give him a huge amount of new money just to, for him to get um, the same amount of new utility as somebody who only has $10,000, right? So the, the way to think about the desire for money, it's a bit like sort of a heroin addict needs more and more and more new heroin to get the same hit, right? So the more money you have, actually the more money you will want in order to get the next marginal increment of utility. So we should expect rich people to be greedy by this theory, not to become more and more indifferent to money. Very important assumption, and a lot of people get that wrong when they think about uh, the principle of diminishing marginal utility. Are there any other examples of this doctrine that might make it seem problematic? Yeah, over there. Well, if I had a, if I had a second Porsche Turbo, if I had a second Porsche Turbo, I would be just really reckless with it, and I could do whatever I want. Like, I wouldn't have to protect the first Porsche Turbo as much. Yeah. But, I mean, it's like, I mean, it, there's more you can do with it, right? Yeah, so why is that a problem? Well, then, wouldn't the second car... I mean, like, say, say if you have, like, you know, you're, you have a little bit and you're given a little bit, your utility goes up, but you really want to protect that little bit. But when you get more, maybe it encourages you to, 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 to save money. So you to, like, wouldn't spend want more. the second one. What? Are you saying you wouldn't want the second one? Well, why wouldn't I if want you the had, second one? If you had one, you, and I said, I'll give, you, I'll give you my one, it's right out there, you wouldn't want it. 
Uh, it's not that it's not that I wouldn't you, want you it. You wouldn't it's, be like Jay Leno, who like, <laughs> right? How many cars does Jay Leno have? These too many. <laughs> it's it's not that I wouldn't want it, but maybe the the utility for the second one in some cases would be more than the utility for the first one, so the curb would be because, thrown off. Because because you want to protect that first one. Like okay. so so I mean so you don't lose what little you have. Okay, so that's a possibility. Any any other examples of where this becomes problematic? I mean, think about beer. One beer increases your utility a lot. The next, you know, and the next, and the fourteenth, and the, is it, is this isn't it going to at some you know or taking an aspirin? Isn't it going to you know? No. Uh, what about other values like integrity? If you have a little bit of integrity uh, and you get some more, but if you have a lot of integrity, you know, like uh, a little bit more is okay, still so worth an equal so amount. So integrity is a great example because once you start putting values like that out there, it I think threatens the idea that it's all reducible to a single index, right? Because... Um, you can't, having a little bit of integrity is sort of like being a little bit pregnant, right? Once Elliot Spitz's integrity is blown, it's not like he's, there's some, it's, 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 it's a binary good. You either have it or you don't, right? People think he's either a hypocrite or he's not. It's a binary thing. It's, maybe some people are somewhat hypocritical, but it's, it seems like it's, uh, there's a threshold there and you use one side of it or the other. And so there might be some goods like integrity that are not easily capturable in this logic. We should put that out there. But yeah, over here. What about like uh, health? I mean, health. It's, it's not quite binary, you know, because you can be in medium health, but I think it would be pretty useful to be healthy and then super healthy. Like I guess, you know, ad infinitum. Infinitum. Health. The thing about health, it's, it's tricky to actually less so in our day than Bentham's. It's tricky to think about redistributing health, right? Although, you know, uh, the, you'll see that there we, co we will come up against some pretty bizarre cases. Like if, you know, if some people are sighted and some people are blind, you could trans and you could do eye transplants. Should we be transplanting from the sighted to the blind? Arguably, you know, the blind person would gain more utility from getting one eye than the sighted person would get lose from losing one eye. So shouldn't we do that? So that can be also uh, give you some some ways of proceeding that would make you queasy. Right, if you allow the principle of diminishing marginal utility, what what would what about the examples I threw out there? Beer and aspirins, they're a bit like the sort of left shoe examples, right? I th I don't think those are actually deep problems for Bentham's theory because I think what he would say is, well, uh, you you drink beer at some point you would start you would sell the beer rather than make yourself paralytically drunk. Uh, and feel terrible, you'd sell the beer and use that to buy some other good uh, that would give you increasing utility at a diminishing marginal rate. So um, the main thing is that the fungibility of utility in it and its um, expressibility in terms of money, although as was pointed out here, um, when we think about the diminishing marginal utility even of money, we shouldn't think that that makes you care less about money the richer you get. Rather, it will make you care more about money the richer that you get. Okay. Now, here's a, here's a historical statement about the principle of diminishing marginal utility. Every serious economist since the 18th century has assumed that the principle of diminishing marginal utility is true including Jeremy Bentham. You can't do economics without assuming that the principle of diminishing marginal utility is true. 
And I think if you threw out some of these problematic instances, like integrity, um, I think that what, what Bentham would have said, or what any economist would have said, well, yes, there are some things that are not capturable easily, or easily captured by this idea. But it's, if you want to get it right, if you want to see how people are going to behave, if you want to get it right, it's a better assumption than any of the competing assumptions you could make. It's going to get you closer to the truth more of the time than not assuming the principle of diminishing marginal utility is true. So Bentham would have probably said that, I, th I think, if questioned or if somebody had probed with some of these counterexamples. So it's, it's the best assumption you can make given that you've got to assume something. But now, and now I want to come back to the sophisticated point that was made in the middle at the back there a few minutes ago when you start to think about the utility that people at the bottom of the social order derive from a particular good versus the utility that the people at the top of the social order derive from some particular good. Because in Bentham's scheme, remember, we are allowing comparisons across individuals. Let's suppose a two-person society again, um, and let's suppose it consists of Donald Trump, or it can be a multi-person society, but we're just going to focus on two. Donald Trump and a homeless woman living out of a, out of a left luggage locker in Grand Central Station. Actually, there are no lockers at Grand Central, but they are at Penn, at Penn Station, okay? Um, and the question is, should we take a dollar from Trump and give it to the bag lady? What, what, should we? Yes? No. How many think yes? Okay. Yeah, almost everybody. Why? Because by assumption of the principle of diminishing marginal utility, we take the dollar from Trump up there, he, his loss of utility is negligible, but we give it to the, the woman uh, who's starving down here, and her gain in utility is enormous from that dollar, right? So we should take the dollar from Trump. Let's assume there's no dead weight loss to the government and all of that for right now. We will just keep it simple. We should take that dollar from Trump and we should give it to the bag lady. And the greatest happiness of the greatest number will have increased. Right? But then maybe we should take another dollar. Shouldn't we? I mean, it worked the first time. So we should take a second dollar from Trump and give it to the bag lady. And a third dollar. And a fourth dollar. When are we going to stop? When are we going to stop? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to stop at the point of perfect equality. Right? We're going to keep redistributing until they have the same amount. So now you should be able to start to see why classical utilitarianism was a doctrine that was thought to be profoundly radical and frightening to rich men. Because it had this built-in impetus for downward redistribution. You can say, well, there'll be cost, there'll be deadweight loss to the state, and so on. But still, the underlying logic says, take it from Trump and give it to the bag lady. Right? At the margin, that's what you should do. And Bentham completely saw that this was an implication of his doctrine. Now, Bentham was a fairly radical guy. He was a supporter of democracy, which was a radical thing at that time. But he wasn't, he, he wasn't as egalitarian as all that. And he wanted to temper the downward redistribution that flows from his principle. And so, 
he makes a distinction between what he refers to as absolute and practical equality. He says, suppose by the commencement be made by the empowerment of a government of any kind in the design of establishing it absolute equality, that's redistributing to equality, the effect would be that instead of everyone's having an equal share in the sum of the objects of general desire, and in particular the means of subsistence and the matter of abundance, no one would have any share of it at all. Before any division of it could be made, the whole would be destroyed, and destroyed along with it by those, those by whom, as well as those for the sake of whom, the division had been ordained. He's basically saying, if you want to reduce that to a bumper sticker, he's saying the rich will burn their crops before giving them to the poor. And that is a common argument in politics. It's the sort of reverse of trickle-down, right? Trickle-down is the notion that you allow inequality because the rich will create more wealth for everybody, right? The pie bigger for everybody, and so the greatest amount of utility is increased by allowing inequality. This is the, the inverse claim. Bentham saying, well, yes, in principle, absolute equality would maximize the greatest happiness of the greatest number, but in fact, if a government set out to do that, the rich would rebel. And this is a claim that is often made in everyday politics. So um, you'll destroy incentives to work, is the claim that, that you'll hear uh, when we have arguments about raising taxes in the, in the run-up to the fall elections, right? In the transition to democracy in South Africa, people said the white farmers will destroy their farms before turning them over to the majority. It turned out not to be true. So th those examples put on the table, what sort of force does this claim have? It's really an empirical claim. And we don't really know how much the rich will tolerate before burning their crops. Presumably they'll allow some redistributive taxation, but we don't know how much. And a lot of the day-to-day -day argument of politics turns around how much. So Bentham makes a distinction between absolute and practical equality, and he says we should redistribute to the point of practical equality, but not to the point of absolute equality, because it has redistributing beyond practical equality has this perverse counter trickle down logic and that's not going to be acceptable from the standpoint of the principle of utility okay so when you allow both interpersonal comparisons of utility and you assume diminishing marginal utility utilitarianism becomes a very radical doctrine you can hedge it in to some extent with claims of this sort, but they are themselves controversial, and you're going to get into a very messy world of macroeconomic predictions and counter predictions about whether and when you reach this point of practical equality or when the the uh, gains from downward redistribution are offset by the losses from the shrinking of the pie. Now, some of you might have said, well, at the beginning of this course of lectures, Shapiro said, every Enlightenment thinker is committed to two postulates. One is that we can have a scientific theory of politics, and the other is that individual freedom operationalized as a doctrine of rights is the most important good. Now, having sat through these lectures on Bentham, I can see what he's saying about science, you know, 
Bentham has this monomaniacal view of science. He's got his object of egoism. He can figure it all out, what, what will maximize social utility. He can run around the world writing constitutions for people. He can de devise a whole public policy that's going to scientifically maximize the utility of society. But you know, I'm not seeing a whole lot of room for rights in this doctrine. It seems to allow ethnic cleansing, even genocide. It seems to allow redistribution from one person to another, all justified on the grounds that this is maximizing the total utility of society. Well, even if it is, how does this respect individual rights? Am I just wrong? Is there something, some elementary thing I've missed here? There's not much room for rights in Bentham's doctrine. So I'm just wrong that these Enlightenment thinkers were committed to individual rights. It would be a reasonable inference from what I've said so far. But remember, For Bentham, when we try to maximize utility in the society, individual motivation is vital. This is a passage I, I read to you last week, but I'm just repeating it. The greatest enemies of public peace are the selfish and dissocial passions, necessary as they are. Society is held together only by the sacrifices that men can be induced to make of the gratifications they demand. To obtain these sacrifices is the greatest difficulty, the greatest task of government. He's saying you have to work with individual motivations. You can't ignore them. And I think that's, that is the point that's behind his distinction between absolute and practical Equality. The rich will burn their crops before giving them to the poor. You have to take that into account. You have to see individuals as the basic generators of utility. In another piece of Bentham's writing, which I didn't have you read, but I'll just put it out there because it's, it's where you start to see our old friend, the workmanship ideal, creeping by the back door into utilitarianism. Bentham says, law does not say to man, work and I will reward you, but it says, labor, and by stopping the hand that would take them from you, I will ensure you the fruits of your labor. It's natural and sufficient reward without which, without me you cannot preserve. If industry creates, it is law which preserves. If at the first we owe everything to labor, at the second and every succeeding moment we owe everything to law. So another way of thinking about this is that Bentham's idea of the state is essentially regulatory. It stays the hand of the somebody else who would steal your goods, but the government cannot itself create utility. Labor creates utility. And this is why I say that workmanship, our old, I, that idea that we first confronted when we talked about Locke, comes into utilitarianism by the back door. Because Bentham's going to say, unless you respect individual rights, you're not going to be able to maximize utility for the society as a whole. So the state is a, basically a regulative state not a state that's actively involved in creating utility for individuals. It will do some redistribution to the point of practical equality, but the basic idea is that the state should be hands-off with respect to the utility creation in the society. It's industry that creates utility, labor, work. So incentives are going to be important going forward if you're going to maximize utility. So that's the way in which 
we see that even a classical utilitarian like Bentham is going to resist dispensing with the doctrine of individual rights. Now, there's a problem, though, with his mode of doing this. And the problem arises because the claim that the rich will burn their crops before giving them to the poor might not be true. And even if we get to less extreme circumstances like South Africa before and after the transition, when we look at actual debates in contemporary politics in the United States, this is what we see. Ronald Reagan comes in and says, if we cut taxes, this is in 1980, if we cut taxes, um, the pie will get bigger for all, and there'll be actually more revenue. And so utilitarianism says do it. And the Democrats say no, no, they won't. Um, and it's an empirical argument. And you will find, uh, if you go back now and look at uh, what happened during the 1980s, perfectly credible economists will line up on both sides because they cut the taxes, but of course, eight other things happen uh, as well that affect the macroeconomy, right? And disentangling who got, who, how much the tax cuts were responsible for what happened versus how much many other things that happened were responsible, nobody really knows. Or if you look at the current debate we watched and are watching unfold about the economic stimulus, if the economy turns around between now and November, you know, the, the Democrats will probably do a lot better than if it doesn't. Um, but, you know, the Republicans will say, well, it would have turned around faster if we hadn't had all this taxation. You know, and Paul Krugman would have, will say, well, it would have turned around even faster if we'd had more taxation. And so a lot of the problem in debating incentives, once you get into the real world of macroeconomic policy making, is that A, you never have the counterfactual. You can't go and rerun history without the stimulus, right, or without the Reagan tax cuts. And B, the sheer complexity, so many other things happen. The price of oil goes up, or the you know, commodities collapse, or the dollar, or this or that, or the Chinese un, you know, revalue, do or don't um, change the value of their currency. So that when it gets down to it, when it gets down to it, you're never going to get a definitive answer to the question, what is the point of practical equality? When have we passed the point of practical equality? To use Bentham's terminology. Are we close to it? Have we gone by it? Are we nowhere near it? You know, there have been periods in our history when we've had marginal, top marginal tax rates of 90 percent. Right? Reagan thought a top marginal tax rate of 40 percent was beyond the point of practical equality. You're never going to get a definitive resolution of those questions. But if we think back to what the aspiration of the early Enlightenment was, it was certainty. To use the, the example, remember I read you Ho from Hobbes' Six Professors of uh, his epistle dedicatory on the, to the Six Professors of Mathematics. He said, for the things we don't make, we can't know, we can only guess about the causes. Right? Well, here we're guessing about the causes. We don't really know. And there will be the people who want either policy will be able to find a plausible uh, set of experts to defend their view. So you get into this very messy world of macroeconomic prediction if you want to put some limits on the radical edge of classical utilitarianism. 
And as a matter of history, that's not how it went. As a matter of history, how it went was to rethink the analytical structure of utilitarianism in a way that completely defanged its radical redistributive edge without any reference to these messy macroeconomic considerations. And just how that happened in the transition from classical to what we're going to call neoclassical utilitarianism is a subject with which I will begin on Wednesday. See you then.